Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know it's for, for a couple of you. It's your first Brain Club, and that's awesome. Welcome. And uh, and uh, I'll introduce myself, even though I know all of you, um, I'll introduce myself for those watching on recording. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director at All Brains Belong. And I will share screen. So tonight is our um, new month, new month, new theme. Um, uh, uh, so so uh, urgency culture is our theme for February. We'll talk about what that is, um, although it may be implied, like about what, but like not only what it is, but like where it comes from. And we're going to connect it to the concept of internalized ableism. Um, just by way of introduction, um, our community agreement or that you can participate however you are comfortable. Um, as many of you have figured out already, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to look at the camera. Um, walk, move around, stim, fidget, eat. Yes, and everyone is welcome. Um, you can communicate however you're most comfortable. You can unmute and shout it out. You can type in the chat box. You can, you know, any, any way you want to communicate. And just a word about language, you'll hear myself and maybe other people tonight using identity first language. Um, for example, um, I'll, I'll refer to myself as autistic because for me and for many neurodivergent people, um, autism is not something that I have to separate from my identity. Um, and so um, everyone is welcome to use language to refer to their own identity uh, because we want to affirm all aspects of identity and respect and protect one another's access needs. And, um, uh, and, and, and and as a, a community access needs, a collective access need, just a reminder that today is for education purposes, it's not for medical advice. And um, individual traumatic experiences are best processed in a therapeutic setting, not at Brain Club. Last bit of access needs. Um, closed captioning is enabled. You just need to turn it on. So if you'd like to use closed captioning, you can click the live transcript CC icon. And if your version of Zoom doesn't have that, try the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. Okay. Um, and you can click hide subtitles, hide subtitles, turn it off. All right. So content warning. Um, we are going to be talking about ableism and internally ableism, which can be uh, quite painful um, for, for, for many people. Um, and so we just um, invite you to take care of yourself, um, how, whatever that looks like, including, um, you know, taking a break, even leaving Brain Club if this topic is not, is, is not a fit for you tonight. Um, and <sighs> there we go. So urgency culture. Um, I'm reading this, this amazing book um, written by a group of Vermonters. Um, so it's called Parenting for Social Justice. And um, in this book, um, the editor, Angela Burkfield, defines culture as a shared set of norms, values, ways of life, and assumptions about how the world works. And some parts are obvious, and some parts are less obvious, and sometimes even hard to notice or describe. Um, and ultimately, culture is based on power systems. And um, uh, this, uh, some people may, may uh, I, sometimes this, this concept um, of the Eisenhower matrix is uh, used in like productivity um, uh, uh, context. That's not how I'm using it. In fact, it's like the opposite of how I'm using it. I'm, it's more to say that in life, there are things that are urgent and things that are less urgent. There are things that are important and things that are less important. Um, so often messages are sent that things are urgent and important, but it's false. So urgency culture is the is is this world where that false message of urgency and importance is like the alarm is sounding all day long. And um, uh, this quote comes from Stephen Covey. Urgent matters are those that require immediate attention. Um, these are these visible issues pop up, demand your attention now, um, and come with clear consequences for not completing them. Um, putting spending too much time putting out fires can produce a great deal of stress and result in burnout. No kidding. 
So in a world where messages of urgency are sent all the time and it's false, um, I would submit that that is uh, bad for health. So zooming out, I've got this, uh, this image of, of Google Maps because you know you're like so zoomed in, you don't even know what continent you're on sometimes. When you zoom out, what is urgency culture reflective of? It's a product of power systems so many different types of power systems. And um, the first time this came to my attention, um, it, it, it was like, oh, how did I not see that before? And once I have the kind of brain that when the pattern is named and spotted, I can't unsee it. And I, in fact, see it everywhere. And so, um, and, 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 and I think awareness of being controlled by a power system is the first step of, 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 of and, then, and, then, and then of course it's all the many layers of privilege that come from having autonomy over doing something about that. But the awareness, the awareness I think is what, 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 what may allow um, the, the zooming out and saying, this is not a reflection on me. This is, this is a system. I was set up. And so how this connects to ableism, and of course, when we think about the intersectionality of all the many ways in which we, people are othered in all of, the, all of these different ways that all add up exponentially um, for people who are marginalized for multiple different reasons, we can't really talk about ableism like by itself. So I'm just going to acknowledge that. But for purposes of just making the point about how urgency culture connects to ableism, I am going to discuss it in a vacuum, but in real life, it does not exist in a vacuum. So ableism, um, uh, and this, this graphic comes from Talia Lewis, um, a system of assigning value to people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, and fitness. And these ideas, um, Talia describes, are, 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 are deeply rooted in power systems. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we think about systemic oppression, um, urgency culture is doing that. Because when we think about internalized ableism, the, the, the uh, ableism directed at oneself um, as a consequence of growing up in a world where that is ableist and messages of being broken and defective and deficient are everywhere. And so when those ideas are internalized, what happens? There's the fear of rejection, fear of negative appraisal, the message that your needs don't matter, that your access needs, the things you need to fully and meaningfully show up and participate in your life, the fact that you have needs in some way is needy and that that is somehow bad, and the message that it's bad to set boundaries and a lifetime of overriding limbic responses to this is not safe, this is not good for me, this is not meeting my needs having the cortical, the cortex overriding that limbic response, that becomes ingrained. And so um, we're gonna have so much time left. I, I, I'm a recovering New Yorker, I speak way too quickly. Um, I, this, this, was the, this was the only background and premise I had um, is just that I, I think that because of internalized ableism, it makes it really hard to even recognize urgency culture as a thing. You get so caught up in it. So um, yeah, there are some strategies, some scripts, and this comes from the holistic psychologist on Instagram, some scripts to buy some space. But again, you, you already have to be at a place where you have some degree of autonomy and social capital in order to set boundaries because of all the other power systems. So what do people think about this? 
I'm reading in the chat uh, from Amy. Yes, all of this resonates so much. Yep. I can speak to it a little bit. I mean, I think we see it in social structures, but where I have encountered it most is in workplace culture. Um, because I think we have a little bit more control in our social realm uh, about who we, at least we have the ability to have more control about who we interact with and how we interact with in the workplace. There's often just this dynamic of um, disproportionate um, power systems, right, already. Um, and I can, I've been in so many reviews and um, when I worked in um, healthcare center, and I won't mention any names, but um, where my reviews were very soft, like the, the, the feedback was somewhat on soft skills. But when I like would request more clarity, it was like I was supposed to kind of know, like, what they meant by that. And I would ask for specific examples and they could never be given. So it was very frustrating for me. Um, and I ended up just being like, well, if you can't give me examples, then I'm going to assume that I don't have anything to approve on because you're not giving me any examples. And that, that didn't really go over well too. So it was just kind of like, I never really figured out how to make it clearer or easier for myself. Um, to, to like become to some kind of communication understanding. Yes, like that story, I hear versions of that story like all day, like, and I've lived that story. So yeah, totally. Um, I'm wondering, is it hard to even spot that urgency culture is happening? Like, I like, can you separate it from, I'm opening this, opening this up to the, to, to the whole group. Can you tell when there's a problematic culture of urgency? I've Go ahead, experienced, Mia, yeah. I was going to say, I've experienced it like much of my life. Like I know that uh, just day to day, like my parents sort of getting ready to go to school or college, they'd be like, come on, we've got to leave or you've got to get this done, you've got to get that done, like when it comes to homework. Uh, and also when I was, um, when I was sort of an adult, like they'd be like, oh, you can't, uh, you can't sort of hang around sort of thing. This life isn't a dress rehearsal, but actually, and it's like to the point that there wasn't, time to stop and listen to what I was saying because um because there's like all this sort of hustle culture and all this oh you until it was until I had uh, uh needs until I had needs that I felt were needed to be looked at urgently and then people weren't interested in that but it's like when there's something they sort of think is urgent or needs to be it's like there is very much a hustle culture I found yeah yeah I I I grew up um in in an environment where there was it was very much um you got to do the thing and you got to do the thing now because if you don't do the thing there are consequences and the consequences were completely arbitrary um but it was it, it very 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 stressful um, and I think for many people, that's all they've known. Yeah, I would say um, it's very noticeable to me. I mean, well, at least for me, it's been like the advent of Teams, um, Microsoft Teams becoming very popular. I never knew how much something like that would um, really feel like kind of overwhelming or feel like it took over my life in terms of my work. Um, like all of a sudden, you know, I needed like a lot of workplace accommodations because you know that type of thing but I'm not talking about myself basically I'm just saying that with teams I've noticed that it's increased you know at least from my perspective an increased urgency culture a great deal like people are used to using it and there's some advantages of it for, of it for many people however um the instant messaging impact you know we didn't have that I guess if you want to say back in the day um people also started to expect that 
same type of uh, response time, you know, Teams type of response time that immediacy with like emails, with uh, vocal communication. I notice it just feels like for me that it's related um, in some way. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting <laughs> because um, when you think about access needs, um, Teams, I mean, uh, I've, I've, I've fortunately never worked in a workplace that uh, that Teams was a thing for, um, but you know I worked I've, I've worked at a place where the equivalent was a thing, um, and it's the the interruptions. And actually, I did a training last week for this really awesome organization um, that was reflecting that even though no one says that you're expected to respond to Teams immediately, there's like this hidden culture, like the hidden curriculum or the message yeah. of like, it comes, ergo, it must be responded to. I mean, you think about access needs in terms of like concentration, attention, and like all that intrusion, like how are you going to get your work done? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to share a, a link in the chat too, because it's a little bit too hard to explain because it involves um, like neuroscience and it goes and talks about computer systems um, scheduling. And, you know, it happened to work out perfectly for my brain. It may work out perfectly for other people where my brain happens to flow this way. Actually, I started doing this intuitively and naturally and adapting or designing a life around my brain um, according to all these principles, even before I saw the video. I saw the video and it validated everything that I had started doing actually. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put the, uh, I'm gonna find the link to put in the chat, but basically it, it explains how, um, you know, some brains work according to computer system scheduling and it's a more natural way of working and it's, it goes against the way that uh, I guess that are it goes against the norms you'll see when it's a five minute video but you'll see what I mean when I um, <clears throat> put it in there and it very much goes against urgency culture and what people expect in terms of urgency culture so I'm going to I'm going to throw it in there thank you Jade uh, for my uh wife and I, whenever we're traveling uh, through airports, uh, she uh, can't raise her arm above uh, her like, like waist level. And uh, she's like, you can't necessarily, uh, other than the fact that she like limps a little bit, you can't tell that she's disabled right away. Uh, so if like, I don't go first through security and explain to the security guard that like she can't raise her hand or anything like that, they try and rush her through and like start giving her attitude that she can't do it right away. And it's, I don't get really frustrating for her. And I hate the airport for my own separate reasons, but I know that just kind of having to be like, that is really like frustrating to deal with too. And cause it's this huge, like hustle, like, like, like all it would take was for like, you know, four or five seconds of explaining that. And then it usually ends up in her getting like pat down searched every single time, which that is really intrusive. It's so intrusive. Yep. It's so intrusive. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that from a conflicting access needs standpoint, um, and like in, in healthcare, we, I, I, you know, I, I give the examples of like the system, um, many, many, like the system and many environments are dysregulating the healthcare providers. And then the, dis the, the healthcare providers go into a, go into a room or, you know, the, the, the whole interdisciplinary staff sometimes are dysregulated from the system. And then like the energy that's coming to this encounter is having adverse impact on the patients. And, but like, no one's naming that. It's just like chaos and angst. Um, and I wonder to what extent that also is what goes on in airport security, like the pressure to churn the thing and do the thing. And like, the like, yeah, it's, 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 it's culture and it's problematic and it's causing harm. Um, and without awareness, I think of like, I mean, most people don't, they have no awareness of, of like your own levels of regulation. Um, let alone be able to say like, this is, you know, not me. Um, I'm reading, um, um, reading in the chat. Oh, 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 it's, it's Mia and Mia's raising your hand. So um, I can, I can read to myself while, while, while you can, well, if you'd like to speak, Mia, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was saying that uh, to Jade, as a, as a trans woman with issues around my body, I was unable to see an elderly relative in India before she died because I was too afraid to fly and nobody would work with me to grant me reasonable adjustments until it was too late. 
And I was subjected to a 10 year hate campaign just for trying to raise awareness of this issue. Uh, and it's like, I've often felt alone on this. So it's like uh, really helpful to see that there are other people who feel that way. Uh, and um, and it's like, if, if you, if you ever want to uh, talk, just feel free to add me on Facebook or wherever. But thank you, Mia. You are not alone. There are so like the power systems play out in in really really awful ways. Sarah, they make us feel we're alone. Sorry. Yeah, and that's part of the power system, right? Like yeah. that's that's part of what I, keeps the power perpetuates the power system. Yeah. It's and the narrative. Yeah. Sorry, the narrative is, oh, no one else feels like this. Yes. yes. That is a really, really critical point. Um, and and uh, when, when we, at the end of the month, when we, um, when, when we discuss the Brene Brown book, um, that is one of the elements that Brene Brown asserts as driving shame. So like shame culture is driven by that message that says you're alone. You're the only one. Sarah? Yeah, I was just thinking about when you said, um, how can you identify that you are living in urgency culture? And I feel like one of the first ways to identify it is just exhaustion. Like noticing that you're go, go, going all the time. Sometimes it's hard to see it until you're in that state of exhaustion. So I think like that is a good clue to kind of slow down and identify areas where there's maybe urgency that there doesn't need to be urgency. Absolutely. Um, just catching up in the chat. Um, Emily says, I feel like urgency culture trickles into social world as well. People get impatient if you're a slow talker or pause before answering. Yes. I sometimes find that by the time I have formulated what I want to say, the conversation has moved on. Um, this feels like it's gotten worse in recent years, and that might just be my perception, but I also wonder if it's because everything in our world moves so quickly these days. People feel like they don't have time to stop and honor the time it takes to have a real conversation. And Sierra says, I agree, Emily, that's why I like doing things like Zoom, where I can share my thoughts via chat without interrupting the flow of conversation. Um, and Leah is also adding, I feel, I feel that way a lot. Yeah, I think a lot of people do, um, especially um, when you think about like ideational dyspraxia, the sequencing of ideas, like I have no idea what I'm going to say until I'm going to say it. And if I don't have like the scaffold to be like writing out a thing, it's, you know, it's very hard to fit that into conversation. Amy. So recently I've had more, um, what I would say, like resource or have more clarity around my own direct experience. And so I have been taking more time in my response to like conflict I've had since like being diagnosed, you know, knowing I'm autistic now that um, like I'm changing the dynamics in the, in all of my relationships because I'm like I flip my lid more often and I more direct around I'm not worried about being rude so that when the mask comes off and so I've had this um basically when people are anxious or dysregulated they're used to me taking care of them and so now I'm just realizing oh that's not my job but there's like this I can feel the urgency within them of like and so then it becomes this like disjointed conversation where I'm just like letting them have responsibility for their feelings and so but I'm also like saying things like what happened in that conversation was really hurtful or I might need more time so just before this just right before this I was sending a text to a family member basically saying you know I appreciate your apology I just need more time to process this because it triggered things and I know I'll work through it but I, I had to call my sister and say I feel like this is controversial like, I feel, I feel like this text is controversial and she's just gave me the feedback. Like how is taking care of yourself and giving yourself time and space controversial? And I realize it's because there's this feeling of like being in trouble all the time. And so when you have that, you're 
I have to answer that text as fast as I can. I have to know exactly how I feel about this. And I can probably easily, like, it would be easier for me just to take care of the anxious person in front of me than it is actually to take the time and space of like, how did that actually, that interaction actually affect me? And that's been the difference. And so there's, feels like there's more chaos because I created order by trying to regulate the, my outside world. And now I'm trying to, now I'm like focused and have the support and resource and encouragement to regulate my inside world. And um, so I just wanted to call that out. Like, it's not like a controversial to like, take your time. Amen to that. I think though, um, uh, it may, for, for many people who are beginning the, pro but who are like beginning this journey of like, zooming out and saying, it's not controversial to take your time. Um, a script can buy a lot of time. Like just having like, you know, cause a script is automated speech. You don't have to think about it and plan it out and motor plan it just like, phew. so, so a script might be something like, you know, huh, let me, let me, let me think about that and get back to you. Huh. Just, just, just give me one minute. Yeah, you know, let me think about that before I answer. And this way, and he just kind of rolls off the tongue and not at first, but maybe like after a few months of practicing that, like maybe it's not so stressful to say, yeah, maybe I don't have to just blurt out the thing because really um, I know I've been given the message that something bad is going to happen if I don't respond right away. Um, like I'm going to not be able to respond because someone's going to talk over me, power over me. So I better say something, right? So there's all these, like we've lived experience of, of why, why I think we do that and why we develop those emotional habits. I'm reading in the chat, um, Kat says, um, I don't think it's uh, just your perception. Um, I think referring to Emily's comment about, um, you know, of, of, of that it's getting worse over time. Um, uh, but I feel like I need to shoot off this quick message in a chat before the conversation moves on. Um, I have to type it and then reread it three times. That resonates. Um, uh, and, and before I hit send, because they can't be any typos either. Goodness, no, all the judgment. Sierra. I need to unmute. Um, I was reading something today and they were talking about um, advocating for yourself at work. Um, and they were talking about if, if you have a job that's like nine to five and somebody is giving you something very, very urgent to do at the end of the day, um, saying, thanks, my day ends at five. I will prioritize that first thing tomorrow morning. And um, I really not, again, I don't have a job that's nine to five. <laughs> um, I, I I thought that was a really good way to be like, I, I, I understand this is urgent and I will address it and I'll prioritize it, but this can't be done right now. I will prioritize it when I'm in the space for me to do this thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, and I, 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 I think, you know, whatever that script is, um, you know, that's a script, right? So yeah. Um, the same way that you might say, like the same way that like, for example, um, if, if, if I'm having a conversation with someone and they bring up something really important, but we don't have enough time to cover that thing. Um, it's not that your thing is not important. It's that we really need more time. And so, you know, let's, let's make arrangements that, to, to have, have another conversation. Um, because time, uh, even though I don't have the kind of brain that feels time, time, the way I say it to Luna is that time is a circle. It keeps on going, whether I feel it or not. Um, so, so yeah, um, just, uh, reading, reading in the chat. Um, Emily says I was in a training about a, oh, sorry. I missed Lizzie's comment first. Um, looking at conversations about when people are doing power over me has been really eye-opening. Oh yeah. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Uh, Emily says I was in a training where people were teaching, uh, a quote, social communication intervention that emphasized closing circles of communication. I got critiqued because I was holding conversations with a child I was working with that included long turns and thoughtful pauses. I got told that communication circles need to be rapid back and forth, right? Because as though there's one way to have a conversation, that's the neuronormative conversation of short conversational turns. Um, it's neurotypically biased and ableist. 
Oh, yep. Once you take the mask off, it really can't, doesn't come back. Um, uh, I said, what if the topic at hand requires longer turns and thinking pauses? And they told me the topic is not the point that rapid back and forth is. Oh, man. Oh, good. You called the ableism too. Um, but what I feel is that that's an example of urgency culture directly trickling down into uh, the world of intervention. Yeah, for sweet little get the message that you have like five seconds to get your turn out and then it's not your turn anymore. And then if you don't, and the way that your innate communication style is, the people won't want to, that's the message. And Christina says, I'd like to um, uh, and try to put into practice with my partner before I share something that I'm just going to take a little time to ask, are you available to listen to me for share for a bit before I launch into my whole story? Yeah, that's a great strategy for navigating conflicting access needs. Um, like I have the kind of brain that talks in long conversational turns, but I also have the kind of brain that can't listen to long conversational turns. So it's about when am I available? I think I've said this before in a brain club, but my um, wife is very one thing in her attention field at a time. And I love to just blurt out whatever's going on in my brain. And so I constantly have a list on my phone going of, oh, these are the things I want to tell her when she's in a brain space where she can do it. And, um, then whatever at night I go through the 20 different thing, random things I thought of during the day that I wanted to tell her that I didn't want to interrupt her attention with. Um, and it's, it's decreasing. It's like, okay, my brain says this is urgent because I'm going to forget it in two minutes if I don't say it right now. But by putting it in that separate space, it's decreasing that urgency culture. I love that Sierra because it's, it's, it's really, it's using, it's, it's, it's negotiating conflicting access need via you know, working memory supports, you know, and, and then the visual supports to hold, to retrieve it later. Um, yes. Mia. Yeah. I was thinking of a situation a couple of months ago. I think I might have said it on the call. I don't remember, but uh, I was at the shop uh, at the supermarket and uh, one of the, and the cashier he dropped one of my items and I, I said uh, on the floor and I, with my OCD, I struggle around floors and um, I was trying to say to him, oh, can you, can you not pick that up for a minute just to let me, uh, like, because I was hoping that he'd uh, not, not pick it up until he finished serving me and I was going to get another one, another item. Uh, but he picked it up before I could say anything. And that feels like an example of this urgency culture, like everything has to be done right away. And it's like not even to do with the cashier, but the culture that, okay, you've got to, like people do things so quick, they, they don't know they're doing it. But I actually, a couple of years ago, a similar thing happened. And uh, I posted on Facebook about it and uh, somebody said, uh, I was thinking about how they have this quiet hour in the supermarket. And I was thinking about maybe they should do the same with OCD, like take, but somebody said, somebody responded to me in an OCD group. They said, oh, I'm, um, that, that sounds like I can see how that might have upset you. And I remember her response was something to the effect, but uh, but we need to remember that uh, getting other people to enable it, getting other people to enable us and indulge in our rituals is ultimately bad for us or something. And that made me feel a lot worse for, for hearing that because it's like, what, um, it's like, oh, the way the way you think is wrong almost, whereas actually it makes sense that uh, that I'd be anxious about germs, especially in a COVID, especially after COVID. Yes, and I'm so sorry that you were given that message. I mean, it should be fair. It's it's even you know, it, it, I I think people with all types of brains uh, or many types of brains. Um, it, you know, might not want to eat food off the grocery store floor, you know, like, if it, but to be shamed for that, 
doesn't even matter. It's like, you're not comfortable with it. You asserted your access needs and you were shamed for it like that. And, and so I think, I think um, uh, I, I'm, I'm previewing a lot of, uh, of, of the, the brain club on the 28th, but being able to write with, with this book that we're going to talk about um, is even, even, and please come, even if you haven't read the book, um, it's not like book club where you read the book and come to discuss. It's like, we're just chatting about the concepts of the book, which is concepts we talk about anyway. Um, uh, but, but with, what the idea is that when you can recognize shame as the, as, as, as a very particular emotional experience of feeling defective and deficient, when you can, when you can like name that, and then match the pattern in yourself, then you can say, ooh, just, you know, just like when a bunch of people shared in the chat, like when I can spot a power over interaction, I could be like, oh, oh no, that has nothing to do with me. Um, shame is like that too. So it's not, it's, it's not me. It's like, but that person just shamed me. Like that's a thing they did. Like that's not on me. And that's, that's, you, that doesn't happen if, 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 if you don't recognize it as shame. Um, and that's the thing about internalized ableism. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm reading Nina in the chat. Uh, Sierra's idea was great. When it comes to conflicting access needs, it's hard to hold it in when burst with excitement to tell and my already high energy rate greatly increases. So watch out. Yeah, for sure. I definitely, that's a, that's a conflicting access need thing of like, um, and, 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 uh, I'm, I'm seeing this play out in my household, Luna and I, we both blurt out because we both have no working memory. And so that gets, if it gets labeled as interrupting, that has a negative connotation. Um, when, if it, if, if you through the lens of, you know, limited working memory, you know, dopamine bound brain, highly impulsive, like it's the same thing, but it depends on what paradigm you're viewing it through about whether you're going to judge the person or not. Luna said yesterday, you're not a good person. And I said, oh yeah, why is that? Why am I not a good person? Because you interrupt. And so we had, you know, it was like anti-ableism training for, for six-year-old because yeah, Guess what? It's part of my disability and yours. Um, Kat says, conflicting access needs. When I was on a roll getting things done, I had to learn not to interrupt my kids when they were working in their rooms with their doors closed. I used to go in to grab the laundry to ask questions, et cetera, and it broke their concentration and flow and annoyed them. Now I keep a list of things for later, just like Sierra's. Um, uh, never thought of that as being urgency culture, but yeah, all the interruptions were not really urgent. Right, and I think that um, uh, for, for many people who grew up in a household where very similar interactions happened, it wasn't like because there was something wrong with the person perpetuating that culture. It was its emotional habit, its impulse control, its its um it's monotropism, really. Like, so if you have the kind of brain that fewer things captivate your interest at a time and do so more intensely, um, if you're doing laundry, the only thing that's going to captivate your your attention is laundry, and so you're not going to be able to stop, zoom out, and say, oh my child is studying in the room behind the closed door because you're like doing laundry, attentional tunnel. Um, it's just, it's part of how a lot of people's brains work. Um, uh, Emily says that um, uh, their eight-year-old had to teach them the same lesson to exact same story. Um, and uh, yeah, Christina and, 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 and I would say the same. Yeah, that was my mother. Yep. Um, Nina's learning this also. There's a lot of, there's a, yes, yes. This is a very common phenomenon. Yeah, you had to learn about monotropism exactly. Yep. Um, so, so uh, circling back to the connection between um, urgency culture and internalized ableism, one of my, my, my wonderings when we came up with this topic was that is 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 it is it possible that if you don't if you don't catch your own internalized ableism from time to time does that make it more likely that you get swept up in urgency culture because if you can spot the culture you can be like oh that's a power system 
mm, no. Um, but if you like actually internalize the ableism, um, maybe maybe you don't get to do that because maybe you are, you know, well, if I if I get the message from my supervisor that I don't do the thing and I, do, I don't do the thing now, um, they're going to tell me that I'm broken. And I already, that's already what I think. And it would be the worst thing ever to get that message. Reading in the chat, um, uh, Sarah says, uh, yes, I think of how urgency culture affects children. Their excitement and inability to hold in their ideas get shamed or labeled as impulsivity instead of excitement or passion. And because of the go, go, go nature of our culture and systems, there is a desire for a whole group of kids to do the same thing at the same time, power over in order to keep the same schedule. Um, and Jade says, I grew up in a household where my mom would often make me feel like she was demanding answers immediately. And it took me a long time to realize with tech messaging, for example, that I don't actually have to respond to this right away, especially if I'm trying to do something, sleep or need time to think about it. Yup. Sarah. I, I, this is maybe obvious and impl imp or implied in what, what's already being said. But for me, I, I'm thinking that ur urgency culture is, is sort of um, inextricably intertwined with productivity culture. And so what, and, and what that means, I mean, the assumption that I grew up with was that it was okay to interrupt people who weren't quote unquote doing anything or, or the person who had the, the person who had the, the, the highest productivity need that, or the higher level of product, you know, the, the higher ranked productivity thing they got to interrupt the lower productivity person. The, the the higher value of productivity gets to inter, gets to trump the lower. Yeah, like yeah, exactly the power system thing. And so, it's really it, like a lot of the, the urgency is tied to the productivity, which is then which is basically when and when we're talking about that, we're talking about basically we're talking about survival needs. So we're back into the people are like, if I'm not, it's urgent because if I, or at least for me, the way it tracks is it's the reason that it's urgent is because I need to be productive in order to do blah, 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 in order to survive or have the kind of life that I think I need to have. So anyway. Right. Because that is culture. Um, you, you know, and when you grow up being fed a message of what like how the world works, but not necessarily reflecting on like what makes it so. Um, if you like miss the power system part of it, if you miss, if you really, if you miss the social justice framework, um, uh, which was certainly, I was never taught about this. It was just like, oh well, yeah, you have to be productive so that you can do the things without like, what does that mean? What for? Um, and and it's 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 everything you just everything you just said. Um, 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 I'm reading in the chat, Christina says, I think my kids probably made me realize how much I did not align with urgency culture. Having kids means you get interrupted so much. And I became very familiar with how not good it was for me. And now I just gently ask them to let me finish my task. And I've given this response to others now. Totally. It's conflicting access needs. Um, the person needs it now while, uh, you need it not now. Um, and just, just having a script of, yeah, let me get to a stopping point, or I need a minute, um, you know, uh, because that's, that's part of niche construction. But I think, I think the point that Sarah raised just now when they said that, you know, the person in power gets to interrupt the person with less power, um, and just how, how normative that is. Um, and that's so, that's so, yeah. Um, in a couple of weeks, um, when we have a, um, we've, we've, we've uh, I think it's the 21st, is uh, urgency culture at work, and this is going to come up a lot, I bet. Amy, sorry, I saw your hand, and then. Yeah, I think it. I had a thought, I'm not sure, but I know that I had this, like, a whole year where I kept getting called out for inter being an interrupter, and so I really went inside with it and was like, well, why, I don't feel like I'm an inter interrupter, because I know it's hard for me to speak, particularly in certain, like, environments, and so I really thought about it. And what I realized that most of the people, the people who were telling me I was an interrupter were cis men. And it was at a time where I was like really evaluating that. And I was like, you get to call me an interrupter, but you don't actually create space for me to exist. And so I, ha I literally have to interrupt because you have these like 
monologues of like your train of thought and like it's actually gets boring um because I have things to contribute you know and so I basically was like I'm not going to be called an interrupter because I don't think I think I it's like I have to in order to like participate <laughs> yes Yes. Um, by the way, I'd say, you know, the, 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 the monologue, the long conversational turn uh, that gets back to, to Emily's point. Um, so, so, so often, um, and this is, I think we, we talked about this a bunch of times in last month's spring clubs of like the person when there's power imbalances, the person turns their access need into policy and culture. Um, and so, uh, I have definitely worked in systems like that. Jade. I noticed a uh, uh, huge uh, difference in my transition of just like the assumptions that I would be granted and the uh, just like, uh, just like the way that stood out to me, like was not lost on me very quickly uh, and it was uh, just something it, like it could also get pushed in the direction of uh, I will get just pushed in like, like, oh, you're the token queer person. So that's just like, that's my only representation to the group now is just as that. So like they'll try and like pigeonhole it to just that sometimes too, uh, which gets really frustrating. Uh, and, but uh, uh, I don't really know where I'm going with this anymore, but just something I've uh, noticed. Yeah. Do you, are you in a, are you, are, are, I mean, I, I imagine it may depend on the, on, on the crowd. Um, but it's, it's, I, I, I wonder, is there a, what do you do with that when that happens? Are you, uh, is some, is there anyone else who can intervene on your, can intercede on your behalf to give feedback so it doesn't fall to you to be giving the feedback? Uh, I, uh, this can be kind of a weird card to play sometimes, uh, but our HR person is actually gay, which I said I go to her a lot, but um, I had one guy try who, who interpreted that as me just running off to the HR person to complain, which was just bogus in its own way. Uh, and, but yeah, but that she's, so frustrating. but she's been a good resource. At least I'm, I'm glad you have a supportive presence and uh, Sarah. What, what Amy was saying earlier made me sort of think about um, about not being about the, the long monologues is is if you look is um, that, that's a little bit of like what the experience of the ADHD kid is in school. Like there's this incredibly long monologue that has nothing to do with the, the you, you know nothing to do with the with what's important to most of the kids in the classroom, and the the ADA kid is sort of or the ADD kid is kind of calling calling it out. <laughs> it's like this monologue is going on for so long, and I'm you know and and now I'm and I'm not gonna I'm I'm I I, and I can't stand it anymore. And um, and then they and they get labeled the anyway they get labeled the um, interrupter when when basically there's no space for the, that person's reality and probably most of the realities of most of the children in the classroom. Yeah, so let's play that out because um, now two people have brought that up um, is like the narrative you get as a kid. So if you get a narrative that says you know you're an interrupter or in any way it's bad to interrupt, meaning it's, you know, and that can be extended to, it's bad to take up space. It's bad to, you know, like to, to negotiate dynamics by like, but then you also get shame for like, you know, why are you not talking? Why don't you say anything at the party? Why don't you participate in class? There wasn't space. Um, and I think, I, and, then, and then, then people internalize the, oh, I'm the person who doesn't know how to talk in groups. Um, and, 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 and there's that balance or even, you know, let's think about this, um, even let's take this group, right? So let's, let's, let's think about brain club and there's, you know, even, even amongst, um, you know, you know, a, a neurodiverse group, um, uh, there's some neurodivergent 
find people um, who freely, freely flow ideas in real time in conversation. And there's some neurodivergent people who don't. Um, and just as there's people who hear who don't identify as neurodivergent necessarily who come to Brain Club and engage and have a hard time inserting themselves into conversation. It has nothing to do with neurotype. It has, I think, everything to do with your lived experience and your, your access needs, your communication access needs. And um, I think that, um, you know, I thank you for saying that Kat says in the chat that you read the chat out loud is, is, is validating. Yeah, I think that's part of neuroinclusive facilitation. Um, it's, 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 um, it's hard. It's hard to do, but it's important. It's like part of what, what this is, but yet there's also, it's not the only thing. So, you know, here we are at 652 and most people have not, um, communicated directly, um, whether in the chat or out loud, and that's okay. And I want it to be a thing where if someone needs quiet time for processing and space to insert themselves into conversation, that that is present. And if I'm just like hopping and calling on the people and reading the things, people may not have that. And then I say, well, how do I do that? But then I also don't want, I don't want to do like the, well, if you haven't had a chance to speak, we're going to sit here in silence until you speak, because it's also not required for you to speak or type in the chat, because there's no right way to participate. You can participate. Um, oh, great, Nita, thank you. Um, Nita says in the chat, thank you, not that I have anything to say. Right, no, but it's like, that's just an example of how do we cue safety um, for a range of communication styles and preferences. Um, and some of that is, you know, maybe if there were like, uh, you know, if, if, if when I do neuroinclusive employment training, we talk about circulating an agenda ahead of time. Um, just like, you know, if we do at our advisory board meetings, if there's particular things we have questions about, we try to like put them in the agenda so that people can think about them ahead of time because it's the processing time thing. Um, sometimes it's very hard to process a question or a comment while there's another question or comment coming through. And so I think, uh, you know, this is all a work in progress and it's it's my hope that um, this evolves over time and that the at least hopefully energetically it is felt that there's no right way to participate here. Um, but, but I think, I think, it, I, I, I think probably there's, and there's no like, you know, magical way of solving this problem um, of conflicting access need negotiation, but I'd like to try to figure out if there's any ways that, you know, if there anything that we can be doing to create more space um, for processing. Um, I'd love to do that. Reading in the chat, Jade says, one of my favorite things about my dad was that we could be in the same room or car with each other and not speak for hours. And it still made me feel just as close to him as a deep conversation. Oh, that's beautiful. And Emily says, um, and there's a lack of understanding that you can't always communicate the same way every day. Yes. For example, some days I come to Brain Club with camera on and speak with mouth words. Other days like today, I don't have spoons for that. And so I turn off my camera and type in the chat. Yep. So many people don't understand why I can do it some days and not others. They assume that on the days I'm not doing it, I must be doing something devious, not paying attention or being manipulative or something. I don't really know what they think, but I know they don't like it. And there's, you, you feel it energetically, you feel the judgment. And I think so many people can feel the judgment um, when you have the kind of nervous system that is taking in so much extra information, including you know, whether you call it energy or vibe, you can tell when someone's judging for sure. Some people can. Um, and, 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 and that's real, but so often, you know, think about all the little kids who, you know, oh, you know, so-and-so doesn't like me. Oh, that's not true. How do we know that? Um, you know, and, 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 that's, uh, that's, I think part of it of, yeah, that's your perception is your reality. Um, and I think for so many people, we get the message that we are like detached from reality, but, but what is reality? Reality is someone's own experience. And, um, like, uh, one of the co-chairs of our board, Matt Mulligan, he likes to say that like the goal is to become more familiar with your own experience to your own reality. Um, and so I think 
if you feel it, it is true. So um, uh, 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 next week, we'll be continuing the conversation on urgency culture. We're going to be or have a, um, a community panel, um, uh, some, some of whom are here today, um, talking about urgency culture in everyday life. Um, somebody posted in the chat, Lizzie, we changed the we changed the name of that. It's not urgency culture and relationships. It can be about relationships, but it's just everyday life. You want to talk about the relationships, you can. We're talking about anything. Urgency culture in everyday life. Um, reading in the chat, Sarah says, uh, there's also some group cultures where people pause after someone has spoken to take in and appreciate and reflect on what was said and the possible meaning for the person who said it and how it connects with what others have shared before and what one feels inspired to offer from one's own experience as a result. I love that. Can we do that right now? I want to take a moment to pause after that and reflect on it and what that means for you and how that connects to what's been shared before and um, what 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 each of us may feel inspired to 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 connect to that idea. really cool and because I have the brain the kind of brain that doesn't feel time I think I've paused for five minutes but it's been like five seconds yeah <laughs> Sarah I was just gonna say it reminds me of Fred Rogers like Mr. Rogers was always so slow and so aware of like space and time and not filling every silence and go go going and I think that you know as a child that's why I so connected with Mr. Rogers like that very slow deliberate pace of giving people space and time to kind of process and have a conversation and um, it's so different than children's programming now, which is very fast, you know, and um, I don't know, just the idea of taking space to have pauses. It, it reminds me of Fred Rogers. <laughs> Fred Rogers was like the the ultimate neurodiversity and inclusion advocate, right? I mean, he was, you know, he was the ultimate oblique angle. Totally. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so. Um, I, uh, and, and I'm, I'm working backwards in the chat before, before, as we, as we wrap up, Emily says, I watched some old Mr. Rogers stuff recently, and I was really struck by the slow pace. It was glorious. Um, and, uh, Jade is, is saying the video game and anime conventions I go to feel more real than my everyday life sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and so, so it is so often when people show up as their authentic selves, right? Like there's so many people that just, you know, they don't. Um, and uh, Kat says, uh, I feel compelled to tell them what, what I'm doing off camera, but why? So yes, there's so many, so many people when they are there, they're like, I, I have my video off because I'm eating. Like that's the fault of culture for making you think that you can't eat. Like people eat. Yeah, Sarah. And what, what I'm, what I'm thinking about is the, 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 the con there's a different there's my, my initial idea of conversation as I was growing up was just it's about me sharing what I want to share and and and, and that's evolved over time and 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 I think it's very different there's a the, the groups the quality of groups are really different when the whole group is looking out for each other and the whole group is looking it, it said like usually in mainstream culture, it's the facilitator's job to make sure it's everybody plays nicely together and, and, and we all play safely. But in this other way of being, it's like I'm looking to connect with what you say, with what you say, you're looking to connect with what I say. And so we need time to process with what each other has said and to and to think it through. And and it's the quality of the sharing more so than the quantity of the sharing that really inspires the that that sort of inspires the conversation or inspires the offerings and builds the connection absolutely it's moving beyond taking turns talking um and um moving moving toward a focus on you know facilitating the you know facilitating connection facilitating the, the 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 growth and self-actualization of 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 the group of the whole group 
So with that, thank you all for being here. Um, this was a wonderful conversation and I look forward to seeing you next week. Have a good night.